Now we have gathered a whole list of questions which you have submitted via SMS and WhatsApp and the Straight Path Convention Committee has selected which are the most relevant and applicable to the larger portion of the Ummah. So the way we are going to conduct this forum, inshallah, the questions will be directed to specific speakers but at any time if the shuyukh or any of the speakers wish to add, please feel free to add any additional points if you have any, inshallah. Okay, the first question is for Mufti Menk. Assalamu alaikum Mufti. I come from a place where we have Muslims who practice a lot of innovations and are not willing to change for the better. And they are not willing to accept the practice of Islam in accordance to the Quran and Sunnah by, uh, and, and, and sort of informing the authorities that what we are doing when we are calling them to Quran and Sunnah is as if we are breaking up the Ummah. So please advise, how, do we, how can we overcome this challenge? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in. My brothers and sisters in Islam, we need to remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal maw'idhati al hasanati wa jadilhum billati hiya ahsan. Call towards the path of your Lord. Uh, with wisdom. It needs to be done with a lot of wisdom and with a good method, a good speech, a good reminder, a good way of giving people, whether it is a warning or whether it is good news or any form of reminder. And when you are presenting your argument, present it in the best possible way. So if you look at the context of these verses, it is speaking of the non-Muslims the people of the book, etc. We need to apply even greater wisdom when we are speaking to one another. It's not good enough to just yell at someone to tell them things in a way that chases them away from the little that they do have. So I think if I understood correctly, when we are calling towards what is right, knowing that it is based upon that which is authentic, in the face of that which is baseless, we need to be Polite, direct, at the same time wise in our approach. I have learned that when you tell people things without developing at least a small relationship with them, they are less likely to take it from you than if you were to develop a little relationship with them. So you greet someone, you smile at them, you show that you are part and parcel of the same community, you show that you care for them, you might want to uh, spend a little bit of time before you actually get to the point you would like to get to and you show them that the, you have developed a relationship with them, you care for them, it will be more likely that they take it from you. But if you were to just come in, you haven't greeted them because according to you this person is not even meant to be greeted, then who do you blame? You would like to present a message to someone whom you're not even prepared to greet you're not prepared to talk to in, in a polite way, then I think we stand to blame ourselves and I think we have much more to do in terms of learning methodology and learning the different types of mad'uween. Mad'uween meaning those whom you are calling towards the right path. There are different types of people. You cannot call them all in the same way in every single message. Yes, there are some common messages that everyone needs to know in that particular instance, you will have to let them know it as it is and everyone with the same, in the same way. Like the Prophet ﷺ, initially when he was in Mecca to Al-Mukarrama, as he was walking around the Kaaba, and on more than one occasion, more than one place, he said, nas, qulu la ilaha illallah tuflihu. He said it to all the people, O oh, you people, say la ilaha illallah, you will succeed. The response was different from different people. Some people laughed, some people scoffed, some people tried to harm. But at the end, the result was so positive after a period of time. So many of us lose hope. We say, this man is not listening. I tried with him. How long have you tried with him? Well, I've been chatting with him for the last five minutes. You know, 
So we need to sometimes prolong it a little bit. We the minimum possible time, indeed, but that might be a little bit longer. It may take you half a year. It may take you a year. It may take you two years. It, you may not succeed. But ma alayna illa al Our duty is to convey the message in the best possible way, and then we leave the rest in the hands of Allah. Wallahu a'lam. Jazakallah khair, Mufti Menk, for the answer. Our next question is for Dr. Sheikh Dr. Muhammad Salah. Please stress and elaborate how the habit of referring to astrology and numerology leads to shirk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In the Quran, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was commanded to say, وَلَوْ كُنْتُ أَعْلَمُ الْغَيْبَ لَسْتَكْثَرْتُ مِنَ الْخَيْرِ وَمَا مَسَّنِ يَسُوءُ Have they known the unseen? لَسْتَكْثَرْتُ مِنَ الْخَيْرِ I would have made all the right choices which will give me plenty of goodness. وَمَا مَسَّنِ يَسُوءُ Had I known the unseen, no harm would have touched me. Remember this ayah, especially whenever I see the commercial, like in the States, they offer the first time the palmist to read your palm for free. Or if you call, they give you the first five minutes for free. I said to myself, subhanallah, if this guy claims that he can tell the future, and read the unseen of others and tell them what is good for them and what is bad and what is hidden for them, at least he could have been able to help himself. Because if I know anything about the unseen, I would at least in the stock market buy the shares, <laughs> which I know that tomorrow their values, their worth will double or triple. And I would sell whenever I know that tomorrow I would lose. But this is not happening. It's all wild guesses. And in Surah Al-Jinn, the jinn, after listening to the recitation of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they said, Inna sami'na Qur'anan ajaba yahdi ila al-rushdi fa'amanna bihi wa lan nushrika bi rabbina ahada said, we've heard an amazing Qur'an. It guides to the straight path, to the right guidance. So we believed in it. And we're not going to commit shirk anymore. We will not associate with Allah any in worship anymore. Among their confessions in the ayah, وَأَنَّا كُنَّا نَقْعُدُ مِنْهَا مَقَاعِدَ لِلسَّمَّعَ فَمَنْ يَسْتَمِعِ الْآنَ يَجْدَ لَهُ شِهَابَ الرَّصَدَ we used to take seats in the heaven, in the holy heaven, when Allah the Almighty will give the commands to the angels to execute them. Somebody will be born, somebody will die, somebody will have an accident. So the jinn used to overhear the writing of the angels. And they would take some valid informations, 100% concerning the future. Then they will share it with one of the the Kohan, astrologists, palmists, fortune tellers, soothsayers, you name it. فَيَكْذِبُونَ مَعْهَا مِئَةَ كَذِبَةً If they share something concerning the future, which is true, because they heard the angels writing that they have to execute this command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah the Almighty ordered them to do it. So when they take this information and they share it with this fortune teller and he announces that an earthquake measures that much will hit the city or this town or this team would win the Super Bowl or this wrestler would win the game and it is true. So that people will believe in this person that he knows the future, he knows the unseen. And it's a human nature. They will go to him, ask him, 
even though he may fail another hundred times, but because he got it right once, they will continue, they will continue to believe him. فَيَكْذِبُونَ مَعَهَا مِئَةَ كَذِبَةً that's why the Prophet ﷺ says, whoever visits a kahin, a soothsayer, and he believes in what he says, فَقَدْ not only ashrak, he has indeed kafara bima unzila ala Muhammad. He has indeed disbelieved in the message which had been sent down upon Muhammad ﷺ. If any of us happen to try any of these guys and say, oh, it looks like you are in love. How did you know? Because everyone somehow <laughs> happened to be in love. It looks like you're having a little trouble with your love. <laughs> and who doesn't? <laughs> um, at work, your boss is giving you a hard time. And whose boss is not giving him a hard time? <laughs> so these informations are common informations. When people trust the soothsayers, the fortune tellers, they are foolish. Not only that, if they are Muslims, and now if they know by now that no one knows the unseen whatsoever but Allah. Even in the long hadith of Umar ibn Khattab, who described Jibreel alayhi salam as coming to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, disguising as a traveler, wearing exceedingly white clothes with exceedingly black hair, and he asked him the several questions that you all know, Islam, Iman, Ihsan, then he asked him about a sa'ah, the hour, which is one of the names of the Day of Judgment. What is the sa'ah? The answer of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is most eloquent. What did he say? He didn't say, I don't know. Rather, he said, neither the, the one who's been questioned about it knows no better than the questioner. The one who's been questioned about it knows no better than the questioner because later on he explained that the questioner was none but Jibreel alayhi salam. So not even Jibreel knows the timing of the day of judgment. How could you believe a astrologist or a soothsayer or a fortune teller predicting that the end of time will be the year 2020? Even accepting this as a possibility is haram. We gotta differentiate between telling the future and, for instance, the weather forecast, because this is based on givings, estimates, and facts. So we gotta differentiate between this and that. And finally, whoever visits or takes the advice of any of those who claim to know the future have indeed committed an act of disbelief because the Quran says otherwise. May Allah guide us to what is best. I mean, Zakla Khair, Sheikh Muhammad Salah. Our next question is for Sheikh Asim. And this question is also regarding shirk. Sheikh Asim has mentioned to beware on minor shirk, and the examples given are swearing by other than Allah, swearing with the name of my mother, and things like that. Now, the question is is it considered shirk if we do something like praying or fasting, not because of Allah? But we are doing these things because we fear other men or we fear the consequences that maybe our parents would rebuke us or scold us. So is this considered a form of shirk and how can we avoid from this and be totally corrected so that we are protected from that? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillahi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa manihtada bi huda. Amma ba'd, as mentioned in the lecture this morning, that shirk is divided into two types. It's exactly like kufr, exactly like uh, hypocrisy. There is major and there is minor. Major takes you out of the fold of Islam. So if you die while committing and believing, then you will end up in hell forever. Regardless of how many rak'ahs have you prayed, how many umrahs, how many hajj. Major shirk, major hypocrisy, major blasphemy or kufr, this is unforgiven by Allah Azza wa Jal. So there is no hope for a person who does this and dies while doing this. If you did not yet died, you may repent and Allah will forgive your shirk, your hypocrisy and your uh, uh, kufr as well. 
As for the minor shirk or hypocrisy or kufr, scholars say that these are below major kufr, hypocrisy, and shirk, but they are above major sins. And whether Allah will forgive them or not is an issue of dispute among scholars. It is best to keep it as it is. Don't go into too minute details and then you try to uh, dissolve every major thing into making it small. This is our biggest problem now in trying to make things easy. No, no, Allah will forgive you. Khalas, okay, then if I do this, it's a major sin. Will Allah forgive me? Yes, if you repent. Okay, alhamdulillah. Therefore, the brother is asking about if someone prays just because he's afraid of his mother. This by itself is known as showing off, riya. And whether it is in the positive sense or the negative sense, it is minor in the sense that it is not praying for your mother or for your father, meaning that this prayer is to them, dedicated to them by their instruction, rather that you just want to relieve yourself from nagging or from being deprived of your allowance or from uh, uh, having a curfew if you don't do this, so you do it. Now this can range between kufr, which is big, and between something that is minor. Why? If someone does not believe in Allah Azza wa Jal and he just mimics the movement of prayer while saying Allahu Akbar and he sings a song instead of reading the Fatiha. So people look at him and think that he is praying, but actually he's playing. Now this is blasphemous. This is kufr. To the extent that some of the scholars said whoever prays without being in the state of wudu, of purity, knowingly, then this is an act of kufr. Why? Because he is pretending to pray. People believe that he is praying while Allah knows that he's not praying and he knows that Allah knows and he doesn't care. And it's an issue of dispute. Some say, no, it is a major sin. And most likely it is a major sin rather than being kufr. So depends on the intention of this person. Now fear of other than Allah is kufr. But fear is types and categories. So if someone sees a lion and he says, I believe in Allah and I'm not going to be afraid. <laughs> Tomorrow, inshallah, after Dhuhr is the janazah prayer, you can go to Masjid Umar al-Khattab. This is natural fear. We fear snakes, we fear lions, we fear our wives. This, mashallah. <laughs> this is natural fear. No doubt about it. No problem. The fear that is shirk is when I'm in my room, in my home, and I want to do something, and I remember that my boss, my ruler, my anyone I, I fear, he said, don't do this. And nobody's looking. He's not there. But I have the fear that prevents me from doing it, especially if it's something related to religion. Now, this fear means that you fear someone who's not present. And this cannot be except from Allah the Almighty. And we can go on forever talking about this subject. Therefore, I do not believe that someone who prays out of the fear of his parents that this would be major. This is minor because it's in the negative side. It can also be minor when you boast about something. So when someone is praying for the sake of Allah, but he prolongs his prayer. Why? Because people are watching. If he was on his own, he would have done it in like from zero to 60 in three seconds. <laughs> and this is like Ibn al-Jawzi said, uh, may Allah have mercy on his soul in, in his book, Sayyid al-Khatir, when he went with a friend to a masjid in the middle of the night. So they found only one person praying, Qiyamul Layl. So they were talking to one another in a whispering voice that, MashaAllah, look at his prayer. He's praying in khushur and, and very beautiful way of praying. Apparently, the man heard them. So he concluded his prayer quickly and came to them, gave them salam and said, you like my prayer? How would you say and what would you say if you came to know that I've been fasting for the past 20 years? So the man has 
made his fasting and prayer void because it is not for the sake of Allah and Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. Jazakallah khairan. Sheikh Asim for the response. And our next question is for Ustad Hassan. The question is, I have a friend who is very knowledgeable and he's calling towards Tawheed and the understanding of the pious predecessors. I learned so much from him, but he always has this habitual tendency to look for people's faults. He likes to highlight these errors in people's ways. Can you advise me on how to change this friend of mine? And I'm beginning to always, as I'm also beginning to get influenced by his behaviors, I'm also always looking for people's mistakes now. I love him for the sake of Allah and I do not wish to leave him. Please advise. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Um, if I understood the question right, uh, this is something that can actually be contagious, as the questioner says. When you're around someone who believes that they are uh, upon the truth and everyone else around them is not upon truth. And uh, a lot of people have become affected by it, and especially the da'wah in the West. Uh, a lot of respectable imams and scholars have been written off wholesale uh, by this type of thinking. Uh, I would just say two things. Um, first and foremost, any individual that you see a fault in them and you want to criticize them, if you want to point your finger at an individual and say something about them and say, this person is doing something wrong, this person is not worshiping Allah enough, this person does not have enough sincerity, we should remember that every time you point a finger at someone, that there are three fingers pointing back at you first. Every time you point a finger at someone for their fault, then there are three fingers that are pointing back at you first, meaning and highlighting that more often than not, we should be more busy trying to correct our own faults, our own shortcomings, and the deficiencies that we have instead of being busy with the faults of others. The second thing that I would like to say is that I can only guess, because I do not know the unseen, that the faults that this friend of this individual who's asking the question, the faults that they are showing in others is not the faults of their relatives or their family members, rather it's the faults of others. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not ask an individual about others. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. And if we really were to begin to be busy with ourselves and busy with those people who, are respons who we are responsible for, busy with those people whom we will be questioned about, then it would take up so much of our time that we will not find time to criticize others. So the best way that a person could advise this individual is to remind them of those two facts, that they should be busy with themselves, reforming themselves and bettering themselves. And they should be busy with their family members. But if they find that this person is not uh, convinced with that argument, then I would just recommend for them to leave that kind of company and to find others that are uh, working or um, pursuing other things in life instead of criticizing others. And Allah knows best. Jazakallah khairan, Ustad Hassan. Now the next question is a similar related to the previous question as well and it's directed to Sheikh Asim. A similar extension of the question. Now a lot of people, they have a tendency to look faults in others, especially those calling towards Islam, either Ustad and other Shuyukh, and they like to look for specific faults and they call it, the reason is they're doing, doing Jarah wa Ta'adil. They're, they're, doing, uh, they're trying to purify the, the Ummah from the deviations of spe specific individuals. And uh, what's that resulting in is that people, pretty much everyone has been banned from their list of accepted shuyukh and so on. And this thing has gone, gone on, on and on and it's, we people who follow these people have difficulty in finding out how to learn Islam because everyone's pretty much blocked away. So, Sheikh, can you advise on this approach and what is the best advice for us as laymen and what's the best way we can learn our deen? Wallahi, akhi, this takes a lot of our time and effort and this is not the proper way of doing da'wah. I could spend the whole night talking about these keyboard knights who are professional from behind the screen, who attack every 
da'i, every scholar, every imam, with the exception of the four or five allama, samaha, that they have. And if they don't have anyone to criticize, when they look in the mirrors, they criticize themselves. Look at you. Look how you pray. This is pathetic. We would waste a lot of time talking about them. They are nobody. They have no value, no weight. So why should I waste five minutes of your time and my time talking about them? They th uh, thrive on us talking at them and then they rebuttal and talk about us and we exchange fights and blows that the ummah would look and laugh. What are these guys doing? The disbelievers would look and laugh. We are engaged in da'wah. And da'wah meaning calling people to Islam. Whom did they call to Islam? How many disbelievers they've managed to revert to Islam? How many cases of the Muslims they have managed to defend? Zlich, nothing, zero. So I believe that, akhi, move on. A man who was quite old, as old as Mufti Mink, mashallah, <laughs> who, 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 who dyes his beard, don't, he's, he's, he's an uncle. So, anyhow, this is, <laughs> this is beside the point. So a man who is old, but in his, mashallah, health, he's healthy. So they asked him, maybe, how did you reach this old age and good health? He said, I never argued in my life. So they said, no, this cannot be it. He said, yes, you're right. <laughs> Don't argue. Don't waste your time. No, I'm going to defend this sheikh. I'm going to defend my point of view. Leave, move on. These people would just want you to stop from marching in. They're not ser serving our da'wah, our cause. It's like you're running in a marathon. Of course, covering your aura. There's no mixing. There's no music. And it's a, a just cause. You're running in the marathon. And someone wants to help you to give you water, to give you a towel to dry up. But he insists that you stop to take the water. Akhi, I'm in the race. He said, no, no, I want to help you. You have to stop. You have to take the water. You have to drink. He is a hurdle. He's an obstacle in your way. So these people, if you ignore them, they will die away, inshallah, and you will move on, and Allah knows best. <laughs> Sheikh Asim for the response. And our next question is directed to Mufti Menk. I still have family members who are smoking cigarettes despite knowing that this habit is haram. They still do it openly during our family gatherings and in front of our children. How do we explain this to our children? They're getting confused. Their own uh, role model is doing this right in front of them. How do we deal with Muslims who perform their daily ob obligation like salah, fasting and charity? but they still have this nasty habit of smoking and many teenage Muslims nowadays are looking up to these individuals and thinking it's absolutely fine. So what is your advice in this approach? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. My brothers and sisters, on a more serious note, what beats me as a Muslim is when I see the sale of tobacco and cigarettes among the non-Muslims. So if you enter the stores, you, you will notice even the tobacconist and even those who are selling this uh, product, every packet says on it, smoking kills or it says smoking is harmful for the health. So they're declaring themselves and it is illegal to sell this internationally without a warning. So the warning is there from the kuffar, from people who are not believers, from people who have looked into this and come up with a conclusion that smoking kills more people every year. And I don't know if I should say this because I might give the wrong idea to some of the youth, but it kills more people than drugs. Okay? 
Smoking kills more people than drugs every year. And we as Muslimin are still debating in some circles as to whether or not it is allowed. And I've heard in some places that I've gone, they say, no, it's just makro. You know, it's just, those two words never go together, just and makro. <laughs> you know, because the last time I checked, makro means detested. So if it is detested, it is bad. If it is bad, stay away from it. You're a believer. So it, haram is bad, makruh is bad, which means they are both bad. You know, it's the level of badness, and not Michael Jackson style bad, but it's the level of badness that is actually being discussed. On top of that, there are so many countries that disallow smoking in the presence of others because of how harmful it is to the next man. Look at the airports, look at the aircraft, look at the public transport, look at so many countries in so many places. They've banned it, they will fine you. So I think it's very important for us as Muslimin to be upon the cleanest and to look after these bodies that are an amana from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to us to ensure that we, when we meet him, we will be able to say that we looked after the amana that you gave us. The Quran says, وَلَا تُلْقُوا بِأَيْدِيكُمْ إِلَى التَّهْلُكَةِ You know, don't throw yourselves with your own hands into destruction. And in another verse, Allah says, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Don't kill yourselves, don't destroy yourselves. And although these verses may not have been revealed for smoking itself, but it applies in the sense that this is also harming yourself. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for those who are smoking to quit and cut the habit here and now. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters, you will not go wrong. You will not go wrong. Those of you from amongst us here who smoke, and I know some of them, with all due respect, my beloved brothers and sisters, is it not time? Wallahi, it's a question. Is it not time to quit that bad habit? Is it not time to give it up for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is it not time for us to do this one big deed, perhaps through it you may just achieve the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I call on you in all sincerity and with genuineness towards everyone, please give up this bad habit. And this is not the only bad habit. There are so many other habits that we all may have that need attention. Let's think to ourselves, we're getting closer to our graves as time passes. And we need to pass on the torch that I spoke about earlier in my talk. The generations need to be given this torch. It needs to be a torch that is well lit, not a torch that has a flat battery that you cannot see the path anymore because it's all smoked up with cigarettes. But rather, we would like to, inshallah, give them a very good example and we will be rewarded for the good examples that we lay for others and for our children who watch us May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us to quit these bad habits. Wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad. Ameen. Jazakallah khairan. Now our next question is for Sheikh Dr. Muhammad Salah. The question is, how will we know if we are doubting the forgiveness of Allah or not after repenting? Sometimes we repent and of course we have no idea whether our repentance is accepted or not. At the same time, if we are confident that we are, our, accepted, our repentance is accepted, perhaps this might make us complacent. So how do we, what is the best way to approach this when we repent to Allah? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. There are two qualities a believer must possess to be like a bird being able to fly high. These two qualities are like the two wings of any bird. They are al-khawf wa raja. Al-raja means hope and al-khawf means fear. For a believer, he must live with these two qualities. In order to achieve success, Allah the Almighty commanded that in the Quran. Out of hope and fear, the person maintains steadfastness on the straight path. When it comes to the concept of repentance, seeking forgiveness, 
And how do I know whether my repentance has been accepted or not? You don't. But you should have husnul dhan. Husnul dhan is to expect well and good from Allah. And Allah the Almighty said in the sacred hadith, Ana inda dhanni abidi bi. I am exactly as my servant thinks of me. You believe that your Lord will forgive you your sins, you will be forgiven. You believe that Allah the Almighty will be merciful to you, you will be eligible for his mercy. But it doesn't mean that you do whatever you want to do and you say astaghfirullah, we're just talking about smoking. After all, many people in the haram, they smoke in front of the Kaaba, in the most sacred place on earth. And their smoke is offensive not only to themselves, but to others. Wallahi, in the haram. They just step from Al-Mas'a, Safa and Al-Marwa. They are still in ihram. They did not do tahallul yet. The first thing they do once they step out of the Mas'a, they light a cigarette. I go to them one by one. You're here to ask Allah for forgiveness. And smoking is a very bad thing. And you're challenging your forgiveness, your repentance. You're asking him to forgive you. And meanwhile, you're telling him not to forgive me. It's like a thief who's breaking into somebody's house and says, Oh Allah, forgive me. But just let me do it this time. It doesn't work this way. Because for repentance to be complete, fulfilled, and accepted, you must fulfill the following conditions. Number one, you acknowledge your sin. Because if you don't recognize it, you will not repent. Number two, you quit. You quit that sin immediately. And you regret it. And you make a promise that you shall not do it again. Even if it happens again, due to weakness or relapse or whatever, that's a different story. It doesn't revoke your earlier tawbah though. But at the time of making tawbah, you're saying astaghfirullah al azim and you're still watching that bad movie. Then your istighfar needs istighfar. Your tawbah requires tawbah because you are a joker. You're not serious. But when the person fulfills these conditions, acknowledges his sin, regrets, quits, and makes a sincere covenant with Allah the Almighty, I shall not do it again. Then most importantly, as Allah the Almighty said in Surah Hud, to follow the evil deed with one which is good, it shall erase it. In Surah Hud, Allah the Almighty says, إِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتِ يُذْهِبْنَ السَّيِّئَاتِ Indeed, the good deeds remit the bad deeds. So doing, following the bad deed with a good one, it shall erase it. You've done and fulfilled the conditions, that's it. Take, for example, the serial killer, the man who killed 100 people. You know the story and the sound hadith. He first killed 99, then he sought forgiveness. He was directed to an ignorant worshiper. He said, you shall never be forgiven. So he completed his century by killing him. Then again, he had the urge of tawbah. When he was directed to a scholar, he said, nothing can stand between you and tawbah. But if you're sincere, you got to do one thing to show that you're sincere in your repentance. You got to migrate, leave your hometown. Do you know why? Did any of you ever think why this scholar gave the serial killer this advice? He put a condition for your tawbah to be sincere, you have to make hijrah, you have to leave your hometown. Why? Because this scholar assumed that a man who managed to kill 99 people or even 100 and nobody left a finger, that means it's a town of criminals. So because of the effect of the bad peer, you got to leave. What he did, he immediately sat out. He left to show sincerity in his repentance. He just left his hometown and he died. So the two sets of angels, Malaikatul Rahma and the angels of torment, they came disputing. Each one wants to have his soul, to take him either to Jannah or to Nar. 
So Allah the Almighty sent an angel to judge between them. And he said, just measure the distance between his body, his dead body, and his hometown versus the distance of his body and the new town to which he was migrating to repent. Malaikatul Rahma argued that he made tawbah. He shall be forgiven. And he sat out already. Malaikatul Adab, look. We have his record. He hasn't done any good deed in his life. As a matter of fact, what shows a hundred lives that he have taken. Why shall we give up on his soul? We shall take him to hell. So when the judgment came to measure the distance, in another narration, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, in reality, his deceased was closer to his hometown. He just left and was far away from the new town to which he was migrating. Allah the Almighty ordered the earth to expand the distance between his body, his corpse, and his hometown. And to shrink the distance between his corpse and the new town to which he was migrating. Why? Because he showed sincerity. Last but not the least, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anh said, Arja ayah fi kitabillah. I just spoke about arraja. What is arraja again? Hope. Even if you're the worst person in life, you still have to have hope in Allah, in His mercy and His forgiveness. Arja ayah is the ayah of Surah Az-Zumar in which Allah the Almighty says, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. In this ayah, this is one of the most amazing ayat in the Quran. Allah is not calling upon the believers or the good doers or al muhsinin or the minor sinners. He has been calling upon the major sinners, not just the major, major sinners, those who have transgressed against themselves, they have done everything terrible you can imagine. They did not spare a sin, but they did it. He's calling them to do what? Not to despair of his mercy. Despair not of my mercy. Why? Because indeed Allah forgives all sins. Does Allah forgive shirk, which is the biggest sin ever? Does Allah forgive shirk? Answer. If you repent, if you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, not only that Allah forgives that sin which is shirk, which is the greatest and the worst sin, rather, He erases your entire past. When Amr ibn al As came to accept Islam, the Prophet وسلم, stretched out his hand for him for bay'ah. He pulled back his hand, Amr ibn al As. Why? He says, Not before you promise me. Promise you with what? He said, I'm a big sinner. I've done everything terrible you can imagine. Promise me that Allah will forgive me first. The Prophet وسلم, smiles and says, Oh, Amr, don't you know that Islam yajubbu ma qabla? Islam erases and remits all the sins which were committed before. Don't you know that and repentance erases all the sins which were committed before? You know, while we're sitting right now, our sins being forgiven without even realizing. You want to know how? Allah the Almighty loves to forgive sins. Is al afu al ghafur. Sometimes even without asking for forgiveness. Those minor sins of all Muslims are being forgiven 24-7. In the hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, As-salawat al-khams, the five daily prayers. Wa-ramadan wal-jumu'atu ila al-jumu'ah. An offering Friday and the next Friday prayer. And Ramadan until next Ramadan. Are all expiations for all the sins which are committed in between. Those are the minor sins. Those are the minor sins. Furthermore, in Surah An-Nisa, Allah the Almighty says, what a beautiful ayah. What a beautiful ayah. 
إن تجتنبوا كبائر ما تنهون عنه نكفر عنكم سيئاتكم نكفر عنكم سيئاتكم وندخلكم مدخلا كريما simply for avoiding the major sins I ain't drinking for not drinking that forgives your minor sins for avoiding adultery, blasphemy, falsely accusing chaste and innocent people, gambling, whatever of the major sins, for avoiding that, that by itself takes care of the minor sins. If you avoid the major sins, we will remit for you your minor sins, not only that, and we shall admit you into a noble entry, al-Jannah. Briefly, that no one should feel certain that halas, the sin has been remitted and forgiven, but rather he should keep this balance between hope and fear so that they will maintain the state of, no, I don't want to go back to sins. But meanwhile, have husnu dhanni billah. He said, if you repent, I shall grant you forgiveness. Then Allah the Almighty is definitely وَمَنْ أَصْدَقُ مِنَ اللَّهِ قِيلَ وَمَنْ أَصْدَقُ مِنَ اللَّهِ حَدِيثًا May Allah forgive us all our sins. Amin. Jazakallah khairan. Dr. Muhammad Salah for your response. Our next question is for Sheikh Asim. Uh, this question is regarding adoptions. It's very common. And, no, yes. Uh, this question is regarding adoptions. It's very, very common in Malaysia. So the question is, there are many couples in, who adopt illegitimate children whom their own healthy parents refuse to keep the child ever since birth and then the child is being named to the adopted parents instead so question is broken into four parts number one what is the ruling for those biological parents who allowed others others to take care is that considered an abandonment secondly the new parents that has adopted and named the child to the newly adopted father's name is this something that is allowed third what does Islam say regard, regarding adoption of an orphan over an, an illegit, illegitimate child which has healthy parents? Is there a difference? Is there a prioritization? Which one is better? Having between an orphan and an illegitimate child with healthy parents. And last but not least, what shall we do if we encounter such cases and what shall be our action in managing these cases? In short, in very short, in less than half an hour, first of all, adoption concept is not in Islam. We sponsor, we support, we take in our custody, but we do not adopt. Adopt meaning that a, a child becomes as if he's my own. I give him my name and he inherits and he becomes mahram to my uh, uh, daughters, to my um, uh, uh, sisters, and etc. This concept was there when the Prophet ﷺ in the beginning uh, of Islam, when Hakim ibn Hizam gave his aunt Khadija ibn Khwailid Zayd ibn Haritha, and she by, her, by turn gave, it, gave him to the Prophet. The Prophet loved him as a child. He set him free, and he told the people that this is the son of Muhammad. His name is Zayd ibn Muhammad. Then Allah revealed in chapter 33, Surah Al-Ahzab, that there is nothing as such. Call them to their parents. So you cannot call someone other to his father. So if you marry a woman and she becomes Mrs. Khan, because your name is Khan, this is haram. You have to call her after her father and after her family name. You cannot change her name into your name. And then they say that Islam oppresses women. We give women their names. They oppress women. They deprive them from their own names. Secondly, the Prophet has highlighted that he who sponsors or cares for an orphan is with him like this in Jannah. So this is something that is highly recommended in Islam. Wiping the head of an orphan would forgive your sins and would soften your heart as the Prophet had said, alayhi salatu wasalam. Having said that, you cannot take someone into your family who is not part of your family and consider him to be your child. So if he's a male and you did not 
have your wife, your mahrams suckle him, then he's a stranger to you and he's a stranger to your wife who is being called mother by him. When he is 13 or 14, reaches the age of puberty, he's an unmahram. He should not be associated with her or with your daughters, etc. Now, what's the ruling on the biological parents who don't want their child anymore? It's not an option. When you get a child, you don't get a paper from the hospital. Would you like to care of him? Or we will, you know, set him free. Buy one, get one free. No. This is something that Allah Azza wa Jal has mandated upon the parents to take care of, the, of, of their children. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, كَفَى بِالْمَرْءِ إِثْمًا أَنْ يُضَيِّعَ مَنْ يَقُوتْ مَنْ يُعِيلُ It is sufficient of burden and sin upon an individual to waste and not care of those whom he is responsible to take care of. So they are definitely sinful big time. But believe me, a person who lets go, let go of his own blood and flesh doesn't have any concern of what awaits him in the hereafter. He doesn't believe in Allah Azza wa Jal to begin with. So he's not our topic. Now what is my responsibility? If you can take a child below the age of two years of age, so he can or she can, uh, uh, be breastfed by one of the mahrams, alhamdulillah. If it's a male, then try to get the one from your wife's family, her nieces, her sisters, or she can take medication that would provide whole milk rather than skimmed milk. And she can breastfeed the child for five times, five meals, and he would become her uh, 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 son through uh, suckling. Likewise, if it's a girl, then look, <laughs> definitely not you. Even if you take medication, this would not work. So look for someone in your family, like your sisters, your nieces, um, it's a, your mother maybe, Allahu A'lam. And this does the job, inshallah, and you will be highly rewarded for such uh, a, a, a case. Now, is it same if I take someone who has biological father, uh, parents, or I take an orphan who doesn't? Definitely not. The reward is only the most for and the highest for the orphan. And the orphan, in definition, is the one who had lost his parent, his father, before the age of puberty. So I cannot come now and claim for sadaqa because I'm an orphan. My father died <laughs> long time ago. I'm not an orphan by this definition. So if a child who has lost his father, not mother, who lost his father and he is below and under the age of, or age of puberty, he is considered to be orphan. Look for them, help them, give them money, try to cuddle them, uh, uh, rub on their hair. Allah Azza wa Jal would give you immense barakah in your life if you succeed in doing this and Allah knows best. Zakhlah Khairan, Sheikh Asim for the response. Our next question is for Ustad Hassan. I'll summarize the question. I converted to Islam here in Malaysia, Alhamdulillah. And soon I'll be returning to my home country, which is predominantly a non-Muslim country. Given the tense situation that has unfolded recently, I would appreciate your insight and advice on how to remain steadfast in my Iman and how to best handle the potential negative environment that I may face, given the general opinion of the populace, especially even the Christians, who would sometimes liken Islam to be the devil. So what is your advice in remaining steadfast in these kinds of conditions? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. As it relates for an individual who's going back to their country, which is predominantly non-Muslim, uh, or even myself going back to m my country, which is predominantly non-Muslim, every single one of us, we must make sure that we take care of our heart. And what I mean by that is, we have to try our best to do those things that are going to increase our Iman, especially in times of, of difficulty. If we're going to go back to our countries and we're going to 
become absorbed in the societies that we are living in, meaning participating in all of the things that those who are not in the religion as yet, those who have not accepted Islam, we hang out with them, we eat with them, we celebrate with them, then definitely we are going to be affected by what they believe. So like my mother would say, if you hang out with Spanish people, you will learn to speak Spanish. Or if I hang out with Malay, now I know Tarimakase and Sami Sami. Because you hang out with them. So for a person to protect their religion when they are in a community that is predominantly non-Muslim, they first and foremost must find a Muslim community wherever they are. Because the Muslim by himself, the individual by himself, is very easy for shaitan to catch and to, uh, and to make them go astray. No one is a, is, is a mountain by themselves. This religion is based on a community. This religion is based on unity. The Prophet wasallam, when he went to Medina, we know that the first thing that he did was to make the brotherhood. Because if you just leave the people to themselves, maybe they can go astray. But he made the brotherhood to show that we need each other. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً That indeed the believers, they are brothers one to another. So the best advice that I could give that individual as well as myself is that when you go back to your country, that you try your best to find a community that is nurturing that iman and that sincerity and that speaks to your heart and speaks to your spirit. If you go back to your country and you keep yourself secluded and you become one of those people who say that maybe the brand of Islam that this particular community is practicing is not the brand that you want to be with and you isolate yourself, then this is also dangerous because of YouTube and the likes. You will have internets and different fatwa and different scholars that may cause you in the beginning to be interested, but then in the end cause you to become someone who is extremely extreme. So we try our best to accept the people for what they are and the Islam in our specific communities. And I would advise to try to just stay united and to be one Muslim brotherhood and Allah knows best. Zakla Khairan Ustaz Hassan. Now we only have time unfortunately for one or two more questions depending on time. So the question is for Mufti Menk. And this is a question from a sister regarding difficulty in a marriage. I'll try and summarize the question. She has been in a marriage for a number of years. They have children and, is curr and she's currently expecting right now. The problem is she felt as if her husband never loved her since the beginning. And in fact, she has evidence that he is seeing somebody else. And he frequently tells the wife that he wants to divorce because he doesn't love her. But... In fact, the wife loves him. So the wife is in a very difficult situation now because technically uh, she's, she has a, a proper life. She has a, a home. She, she's living okay. But emotionally, she's feeling in, in extreme distress. So my question is, should I ask him to stay and just persevere and suffer for our marriage? Should I offer him to divorce me so that he can be happier? Should I, which is best, to stay in this condition or to divorce? because it's a very difficult situation right now, inshallah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. The first thing to do is to call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance and to keep seeking from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help as well. So Allah is the one who controls the hearts of the people. He can flip the heart at any moment. Many of us, when we faced with a problem, we think of the practical solutions, which is important, but we forget the aspect of calling out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for solution to our problems and our matters. And uh, matters of this nature are not uncommon. They are quite common where uh, the husband needs help. Sometimes the wife needs help as well. They need to speak to someone. They need a respectable person to explain to them if it was uh, okay for me to say, if the sister is here, the husband may be here. If you are here, see us later we will perhaps we'll talk to both of you we will be able to explain to you the harm of this type of relationship upon the next generations and the entire community 
and we can explain how important it is to be able to get along when as spouses when you show love and affection between yourselves it actually strengthens the children psychologically emotionally spiritually religiously and in so many other ways and when we show that there is a crack and we are not getting along then the children get cracked as well may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not do that to us but they suffer the most so a person of this nature would require counseling they would require assistance perhaps if you were to speak to a scholar that that person is close to to address him and to find out it's not easy for us to say my sister get out of this marriage and that's it i've heard some people say this that you know what that's very bad get out of it and walk away sometimes she may walk away from the frying pan straight into the fire she might regret that decision the sabr and the patience that we bear there are two things we need to know at times people keep telling us that what is all the sabr about you know how can you keep on telling us sabr 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 it is true there is a limit but you start off with the sabr up to that limit and you keep on going because la yukallifu allah nafsan illa wusaha allah will not you know put a burden on your shoulder beyond that which you can take and after that point you you are allowed to seek out of the marriage you are allowed to even get a nullification if you fulfill the criteria and if you have been oppressed but start off by trying calling out to allah crying to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking heart to heart to this husband of yours getting someone involved perhaps a senior family member from one or both of the sides and addressing the issue for a prolonged time trying again another thing is you do have children already so there must be some point i mean you cannot have been so silly to have had kids yet you had a problem from day one from the beginning like the sister says there was no love from the beginning well if that was the case you know why did you suddenly have some popcorn may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and understanding it's a reality that we we sometimes go for so many years and after that we say from the beginning there was no love go and think again are you sure are you really sure there was no love from the beginning you know why did you get married then because there was something but we need to build on it we need to speak to each other and i want to spend a small moment saying my brothers and sisters marriage is a very big responsibility very big sacrifice we need to go out of our way to ensure from both sides that this relationship works in fairness equitable terms justice because this is how inshallah the umma will develop we are not mere human beings with no purpose we are human beings with a purpose we are serving a cause we are part of the umma of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam we would love to see the strengthening of this umma you know the hadith speaks of how important it is to have children but that doesn't mean you just have children and forget about them you have to have the children and fulfill the responsibility of looking after those children providing the best possible upbringing from both sides may allah make it easy for every one of us and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all the sister in particular i pray that your problem can be resolved because i believe it can be by the will of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, obviously if it goes beyond the point where there happens to be perhaps physical oppression something you really cannot handle then you may deal with it in a more uh, serious matter you can get your folks involved and you can see how best to address the the issue even if it ends up uh, as a last resort as a last and final resort if you end up separating and with divorce then it will not be something prohibited but rather it is a way out for those who have got to the end of the road wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallama ala nabiyyina muhammad Zakhla khairan mufti mek for the response may Allah make make it easy for the sister and all of us here i mean brothers and sisters the time is 7:15 and unfortunately we have to end our session for today uh we have still questions that we are receiving so please keep them coming we can still continue for tomorrow's forum inshallah so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every single piece of knowledge that we've learned today uh, grant us a steadfastness to implement what we've learned so may Allah make us steadfast as well and keep up the sharing uh back home you can uh, consolidate the notes that you've written down the notes that you've remembered from your memory as well for the brothers uh please share them and hashtag the straight path 
TSP207, and also hashtag the divine rights. So my brothers and sisters, please have a good rest and have, a, have an enjoyable weekend. We'll see you tomorrow, insha'Allah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ratvanjatna, no yalla, let's have